To understand why cellulosic ethanol is so expensive to make, it helps to think about switchgrass, corn stover, and other so-called lignocellulosic biomass in terms of its three component parts. Part one, think of these black licorice sticks as cellulose, high sugar molecules that convert easily into ethanol. Part two, hemicellulose, it's a different kind of less cooperative sugar that's wrapped around the cellulose like this red licorice whip is wrapped around the black. The third component part is lignin. You can kind of think of it as a plaster. It's what holds the plant together. It's why wheat and corn and trees and other plants stand up until they die or something knocks them down. Lignin isn't wet like this, so take the moisture out and here's what nature hands you for your cellulosic feedstock. Now see if you can get the sugar out without expending too much energy. To make the um, cellulose more available to enzymes and microorganisms, for breakdowns to sugars so that those sugars then can be correspondingly converted by yeast to ethanol. SDSU researcher Jim Juleson is talking about feedstock pretreatment. One of the pretreatment options that Juleson and undergrad researcher Reed Formo are testing is clean fractionation. They use reactors like this one to apply heat, pressure, and solvents to break out those separate parts. The idea being that if we can fractionate it, then we can deal with each one of these different types of different materials on an individual basis and maybe it may be actually more efficient and more economical to do that rather than to try and find one method that will effectively deal with them all as a conglomeration. But maybe not. Maybe dealing with the conglomeration using a process called extrusion is the answer. By the way, extrusion is the same process used to make cheese puffs. In this demonstration, chopped switchgrass is being loaded into a machine that heats the material up as a steel screw shears it apart even more. Added water is absorbed by the lignocellulose, which, when it gets hot enough, puffs up in a tiny thermochemical explosion. All with an attempt to break that lignocellulose matrix apart to make it more accessible to the microorganisms. Many questions remain. What's the best solvent to use? What's the optimum mix of heat and pressure? How about fractionation and extrusion in combination? And how do you avoid creating counterproductive byproduct chemicals? That are inhibitory to the yeast or inhibitory to the enzymes and actually slow them down. Then there's the question of doing it on an industrial scale. Theron Cooper is a principal scientist with ICM, an industry leader in the design, construction, and support of ethanol plants. ICM supports some SDSU research, but the company is also heavily invested in its own research initiatives, like this Lifeline Foods pilot plant in St. Joseph, Missouri. Pilot plants provide a middle step between the laboratory and full production. So when you go to full scale, um, you can put in the plant, you know what the expectations are, you know how to alleviate and, and adjust for any corrections or problems that you may identify and you gain a lot of experience by doing that. Given the new federal push for biofuels, maybe the biggest question about cellulosic ethanol is when will it happen? ICM have committed $400,000 to a South Dakota cellulosic project focused on prairie cord grass. Department of Transportation and other funding channeled through the Sun Grant Initiative will keep that project on the front burner at SDSU for the next four years. Reporting from South Dakota State University, I'm Brian Gevick.